Hi there. Welcome to Module 4, Environmental Analysis. Environmental Analysis. Now that we have understood how strategy is, discuss issues about the mission and vision of the organization, find out how we can assess the performance of the organization, it is right to now find out how we can assess the environment of the organization. Now, an entity's environment is anything that is not part of the entity itself. So the term macro environment is usually used to refer to as the general factors in the business world organization. So we want to look out for the environmental factors which influence or which affects the organization and how we can assess those factors and their impacts on the organization so that we can determine what decisions, policies that organization can take in place or can put in place in the strategy designing of the organization. Why is environmental factors important? So the importance of environmental, fa environmental factors for strategic management arises because organizations operate within their environment and interact with this with it so organizations i mentioned in our, introdu in our introduction that they are in an environment so they interact with the environment so that is the key reason why we need to assess the environment too changes in the environment can be large and significant and continually happening so there are always changes in the environment there are factors in the environment are consistently changing so we would have to assess the organization and find out how the organization can, or we have to assess the, these environmental factors and find out how they are changing and what decisions the organization can take in order to gain competitive advantage and then the final one future change can be very difficult to what predict so we can't really predict the future changes by these environmental factors so as and when uh, we, we are operating we must continually be assessing them so that we see their impact on our businesses so what is the purpose of environmental analysis one to understand the factors in the environment that have significant effects on the entity and what it does so we want to understand oh i still have my slide here so let me change that quickly so environmental analysis okay environmental analysis that's what we're doing so purposes of environmental analysis <clears throat> we said that we want to understand the factors okay within the environment and uh, that have significant effect, impact or effect on the entity you see there are a lot of factors within the environment we'll be looking at them later on or as we proceed but there are some that have great impact some have uh, minimal impact some really don't have any impact at all on the organization or their impact are significantly negligible so we have to look at which ones that we must look out for well and which ones that we can really play around in that order too to understand the key drivers of change so we want to look at the various key drivers of change in our environment then to understand the differences in the impact of the key drivers of change so to do the environmental analysis we first have to do the macro environmental analysis okay the macro environment Now remember, remember, the macro environment of organizations, all the factors in the macro environment, <coughs> organizations don't have control, <coughs> sorry, control over what? The environment, right? Or control over those factors in the environment. But we have to assess those factors, identify those factors, and find out how those factors can impact or affect our business. So, we're going to use the pistol module that I spoke about in my introduction. Okay, so political factors. Okay, economic factors. Social factors. Technological factors. Environmental factors. And then legal factors. So these are what you have to understand when we talk about the PESTEL framework. So let's look at them quickly in that order. 
What is the po po uh, political environment or political factors? This consists of political factors that can have a strong influence on businesses, on business entities and what other organizations. Usually, investment decisions by companies will be influenced by some of the factors below, such as the stability of the political systems in a particular country, the threat of government action to nationalize the industry or seize the ownership from private businesses, wars and civil unrest, and then threat of terrorist activities. All these relates to what? Political factors. So businesses, before they make investment decisions to invest in country A or country B, or to expand their investment in a certain country, they would have to look out for, or they would have to be on the lookout for whether there is political stability. There is no issue about coup d'etat. There is no issues about war and civil unrest. There is no threat from government to nationalize businesses because there are some countries where if it is like a military rule, uh, then if businesses are expanding and growing, the government realizes that the business is quote unquote becoming like a monopoly, then the government will nationalize it or seize it from its owners. So businesses in the making of investment decisions have to look at these political factors and find out whether they exist and if they exist how we can navigate through it in that order the next thing has to do with the economic environment or the economic factors these consist of economic influences on an entity and the effect of possible changes in economic factors on future businesses. So the economic factors has to do with issues about how the economy, how the country is run. It includes issues such as the rates of growth in the economy, so economic growth in the country. Two, the rate of inflation in the country, the level of interest rates in the country, the foreign exchange rates in the country, unemployment level and availability of skilled and unskilled labor in the country, government tax rates and policies, and then the existence and non-existence of free trade policies between the country and other countries. So we would have to be on the lookout for the changes in these economic factors. Recently, um, the uh, tax rates have changed and businesses were complaining about the tax rates, especially the importing or uh, businesses that engage in the importation of, of goods into the country and other things. So businesses must be on the lookout and see how these economic factors are going to impact on the operations of the business. Then we come to the social environment, the social environment or what we, we also call the cultural environment, okay? An entity is affected by social and cultural influences in the country or region in which it operates, by social costume and attitudes. Some of these include the values, attitudes, beliefs of the customers, employees, and the general public, the pattern of work and leisure, the ethnic structure of the society, then the relative proportion of different age uh, group in their society. So businesses in their making an investment decision would have to look at the social and the cultural factor. What are the general behavior or value system of Ghanaians? What are the general behavior of value system of people in Accra, of people in the voter region, of people in the Muslim community, of people in the upper class, of people in the lower class, of people in the middle class so if you're a business and you want to establish or you want to go into business you want to establish a business around uh, east legon or around airports all right or those areas you must know the kind of people that are there so you must know the kind of business you have to uh, establish and by far if for instance you want to enter into food okay you want to have establish a restaurant the kind of restaurant you establish in environments such as airports the environment such as the uh, east legon in such a in luxurious environments such as those areas will be different from the kind of restaurant you establish in areas such as um for instance kaneshi areas such as dakuman areas such as you know, because the classes of the people are different there, their tastes are different, their uh, finance levels are different, they demand certain kind of foods, they demand certain kind of quality, they want certain kind of environment in that order. 
Why is social class also important? So that you know the belief system, the value system of your customers. For instance, if you are producing a pork product, okay, you are producing pork products and you are establishing your branch in a Muslim community, it is likely not to do well because it is against their norm, it is against their what, their behavior, uh, be belief system okay it's against their values okay it's against their moral behavior or moral upkeep so if you establish such a business there it's not gonna do well so businesses must be on the lookout for all of these social factors in the social environment to find out what decisions work well what policies will work well in which environment in which society in which country in that order Another thing about the social environment that I would just want to chip in is also about businesses or multinational companies. The way and the modules multinational companies use in Europe is different from the module they use in Africa. It's different from the module they use in Asia. All right, because each of these continents have certain belief system, have certain value system, have certain way of life. Some businesses have to change their product name in countries so that it can suit with their culture system because the product name could mean something else in that order. So social factors have great impact on the various strategies that businesses can take in that order. Then we come to the technological environment. This consists of the science and technology available to an organization and its competitors and changes and developments in science and technology. So we must be on the lookout for how technology is changing how businesses will be done. So how, for instance, as an educational institute, how can we use technology? Yes, we can use technology by having an online course uh, an online study portal where people can visit, people can study everywhere they are, at any time of the day, they can study as far as they have access to the what, internet. So businesses must be on the lookout for in relation to how the technology, how technology is advancing, and how they can use technology in order to gain competitive advantage in their industry. In that order. Now, one of the things that distinguishes premium education have from other tuition providers is in relation to our strong online presence. Okay, we have a very strong online presence because we believe in technology, we believe in innovation, we believe in be able to reach in a large number of people in a short possible time on a sh by spending a, a short amount of money. So that is why we are strong on technology. That's why we are strong on social media. We are strong, our websites are there and our YouTube channels are also there in that order. That is using technology to gain competitive advantage within our industry. Then the last one there has to do with, no, not the last one. The next one has to do with the environmental and the, or what we refer to as the ecological uh, environment. For business entities in some industries, environmental, fact, environmental factors have an important influence on the strategic planning and decision making of the organization. Okay, Some of this includes strict environmental uh, legislation faced with the risk that their resources of raw materials will be used up or at least leading the edge of what? Technology research. So technological, why am I still talking about technology? Environmental factors are very important to certain businesses in the oil exploration, in the mining, in sand uh, production, or in building. In that they they are much interested in what the environmental factors. So, what policies has government through the Environmental Protection Agency put in place that is guiding how businesses will be done and the the, the impact that we can take into consideration in that. It is not really seen here in Ghana, but in Europe, America, and Asia, environmental factors are very key. There is what we refer to as carbon trading. That is the amount of uh, carbon dioxide, the amount of toxic gases that can be emitted into the atmosphere. All these things are regulated. All these things are monitored highly. And businesses pay a huge sum of money in, in defaults of these uh, standards or policies that are put together or that are laid down by environmental protection agency in these various countries. Then the final thing has to do with the legal environment. 
This consists of the laws and regulations affecting an entity and the possibility of major new laws and regulations in the future. So we would have to look at a various legal environment. We have to look at the court system. We have to look at the laws, the rules, the regulations, stock exchange regulations in relation to how businesses are done in Ghana, the procedure involved in the payment of tax, procedure involved in registration of businesses, procedure involved in listing a business on the Ghana stock exchange market. We have to look out for in relation to all these regulations in that order. So the legal uh, factors may include issues such as employment legislation, environmental legislation, the tax system of the, uh, of the country, and then company laws, and then Ghana Stock Exchange laws or regulations in that order. So about the external environment, analyzing the macro environment, political factors, economic factors, social factors, technological factors, environmental factors, and legal factors, these are what you have to understand in that order. But there are limitations to this. Okay, there are limitations. One, to the pestle. When we use the pestle to find out those, there are limitations to it. One, it is difficult to identify the environmental influence that will have the biggest influence in the future. So, which of these factors will really impact on the business? It's difficult to determine that because you've looked at the factors, you know the things there, but which of them to will really impact or significantly impact on the business? Sometimes it is difficult to determine that. And two, it does not provide an assessment for environmental influences. So we don't know the, the level of impact that each of these have in that order. That is what we mean by analyzing the macro environment of businesses. Now, apart from looking at the macro environment of businesses, we have to look at for, or we have to look at the competition, analyzing the competitive, uh, or the competition that exists within what? An industry. So we want to look at the industry competitive analysis. So industry competitive analysis. So how do we analyze competition that exists between the industrial environments? Okay, so in the banking industry, how do we analyze that competition? So we're going to be using the Porter's Five Forces here, okay? The Porter's Five Forces, that's the module or the framework that we're going to be using here. Now, what is the Porter's Five Forces or module about? It describes a framework that attempts to analyze the level of competition within an industry and business strategy development. It draws upon industrial organization economics to derive five forces that determines the competitive intensity and therefore attractiveness of an industry in that order. So, according to Michael Porter, if you want to assess the compet competition that exists within a certain industry, there are five forces that determines how competitive an industry can be, and we want to look at that briefly. The first one has to do with threats from potential entrants. Threats from potential entrants. This simply has to do with the threats from what? New businesses entering into the industry. Now, the possibility of businesses or new businesses entering into the industry depends on certain factors. One, it depends on the profitability of the industry. So if the industry is profitable, then there is going to be a threat of what? New entrants. Two, capital requirements. If the capital requirement for such an industry is small, then people will be in and will come easily. Three, if the industry is less regulated or not regulated at all, then people can easily work or new businesses can easily enter into such industry. So these are some of the three nuggets that uh, makes an industry easily susceptible to the threat from what? New entrants. The profitability of the industry, the capital requirements uh, to start a business in that industry, and then whether the industry is regulated or not regulated. So in order to place a barrier or what prevents the threat from new entrants, we just do a flip side of that. Uh, it's about technology, technical know-how. If the industry requires a specific technical know-how, then it will be less that we are, uh, or the, the, the industry will be less, uh, less susceptible to threats from new entrants. 
The reason is that if it requires specific skills, specific qualification, specific know-how in relation to operating in that industry, then it will place a barrier or a limitation as to how many firms come out, come in there. Government regulations. If government is regulating the industry, then it is going to be difficult for more for new firms to what, come into the industry. Then switching costs can be also be there. Then access to distribution channel in that order. So that is the first thing. Threats from new entrants. The possibility that new firms can easily or difficultly or can easily what, enter into the industry under discussion. The next force is threat from substitute products or services. Threat from substitute products or services. There is a threat from substitute products or substitute products or services when customers can switch fairly easily to buying alternative products or substitutes. Okay, so if our customers can easily switch from the buying of a certain product, then that is what we refer to as well, threat from substitute products. For instance, in the transport industry, if I'm going to Kumasi or I'm going to Takrade, I can decide to go by road or I can decide to go by what? Air. That is what refers to as well, threats from substitute products in that order. Or tuition. If you want to charter as an accountant, you can decide to go for a tuition service, on campus tuition service, or you can decide to take an online course in that order. That is threat, okay, from substitute products. So customers can easily switch to decide that, okay, we want to go online or we want to go on campus. So if it is easy for customers that or there are easily available substitutes of products of that industry by another sub-industry, then their threat from uh, substitute products is going to be high in that order. Next is the bargaining power of suppliers. Now, Porters wrote that suppliers can exert bargaining power over participants in the industry by threatening to raise prices or reduce the quantity of uh, purchase goods or services. So suppliers have a strong bargaining power if they can influence the price or the quantity of the product. So if the suppliers can influence the price, how much they sell the product to you or how much they sell to you, then they have what? A strong bargaining power. Now, how do suppliers have a strong bargaining power? If they, there is uh, a few suppliers relative to the demand of the goods, then the suppliers are going to have what? A strong uh, 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 bargaining power. So they will determine how much they want to sell the product. They will determine the quantity they want to sell to each supplier or each uh, company in that industry in that order. However, if the suppliers are relatively large as compared to the demand for their goods or for their service, then they will not have what, any bargaining power. Their bargaining power will be less. They can't determine the price in that order. The flip side of that point is the bargaining power of what? Customers. Now, customers also have a strong bargaining power if they can influence the price and the quantity. Simple. It's the flip side. Let me use an example. Let's say you produce Sobolo, right? You can produce maybe a thousand quantities of Sobolo. And the Sobolo you are producing, two scenarios. A, the first scenario is that Wexil Small can come and buy 900 of the Sobolo that you produce. So, every week they come and buy 900. What do you think West Hills Mall is going to do? They are going to determine how much they are going to pay. So if they, they, come, they come and you tell them that, okay, my product is maybe 5 CDs per bottle for my Sobolo, they will tell you that we are buying 900. We want to pay you 3 CDs, 50 pesos. It means that they have what? A strong bargaining power. They are your customers, but they have a strong bargaining power because they are buying a large percentage or a large portion of your output. However, if that same Sobolo scenario B, you take it to the market and you are selling it 5 CD, 5 CD, 5 CD to the general public, then the bargaining power of customers there will be insignificant because nobody can come and say, I'll give you 3 CD, 50 pesos. You will sign the person because if the person doesn't buy, someone else will come and buy. That is what we mean by bargaining power of our customers. Now, let's see this. Porters. Michael Porter suggests that buyers might be particularly powerful in the following ways. One, when the volume of their purchase is high relative to the size of the supplier. I've said that already. So you are producing 1,000 uh, Sobolo bottles, but Wessels more can take 900 of that. They will influence the price. 
they will influence or they will have a strong bargaining power. Two, when the products of the rivalry supplier are largely or the same. So if also there are other suppliers for Sobolo, it means that if you don't give it to them at that price, they will go to another supplier and it is likely the other supplier will give it to them. So you will be subject to obey when the buyers has full information about the supplier and the prices. So when buyers have full information about what price is being charged, uh, what, uh, uh, how the product works, what the cost involved in the production of the product, then they can what, influence the price. Then the next one is when the profit of the buyer are low in that order, so they can influence the price. Then the final thing is competitive rivalry within the industry or the market. This has to do with a competi competition within an industry that is the rivalry firm, okay? So the existing firm within the industry. What is the competition? Like, for instance, the banking industry in Ghana has observed a great, or yes, a very great uh, competition in relation to apps, okay? Apps, mobile apps. Uh, one company launches an app, the other company also launches an app. So everybody is going crazy about apps in that order. So because... If that is a competition, everybody wants to provide comfort to their customers, to their clients, so that I can be in my house, pay every bill that I want to pay, I can be in my house, transfer money from my account to another person's account, I can be in my house, do every banking transaction just with my smartphone. So apps, 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 bringing competition in the industry in that order. So in making an assessment, we want to find out the existing firm within the industry, what is the competition that exists? among them in that order. So that is what we refer to as analyzing the external environment. The external environment, we have considered the macro environment, and we have considered the industry and the competitive uh, competition, okay, or comp industrial competitive analysis in that order. Now the final slide we want to look at is the analyzing of the internal environment. I, as I mentioned earlier, organizations exist and they have the external environment and they have the internal environment. Usually, the external environment, the organization doesn't have influence or cannot make anything to impact on the factors there because the factors are designed by uh, institutions, government and organizations that are beyond the control okay, of the organization. But when it comes to the internal environment, the organization can, in a way, manipulate how these factors can implement or can impact on the organization. So in the analyzing of the internal environment, there are three modules that we're going to be discussing here. We're going to be discussing the value chain analysis, we will look at the SWOT analysis, and then we will look at the Werich Taus metrics. So let's begin with value chain analysis. What is value chain analysis? The value chain describes those activities of the organization that adds value to purchased input, okay? The activities of the organization that adds value to the purchased input. So in other words, if we buy raw materials or inputs, what kind of activities do we undertake in order to change that input into output or what we call finished goods in that order? That is what we mean by the value chain. Based on the value chain, Organization can divide the activities that enables them to add value to the inputs to get their finished goods into two. So we have what we call the primary or the core activities, and then we have the supporting or the secondary activities. So what are the primary activities? These involve the production of goods and services. The primary activity includes things like um, outbound logistics, inbound logistics, operations of the business, um, services like installation of the uh, of of products, storing of raw materials, distribution of the product to uh, their customers in that order. These are what we refer to as primary activities. In other words, the core activities that organization undertake in adding value to the raw materials to make a finished goods and also in delivering or transporting the raw materials or the finished goods to the final consumer. Then we come to supporting activities. These are these activities provide uh, purchased input, human resources, technology infrastructure function to support what the primary activities. So this can include HR, this can include IT department. So a lot of businesses now outsource their um, 
HR and IT functions because they don't have HR department in the organization. If they are looking for an employee, they just go to an employment agency firm, give them their requirements, then they recruit that person and then they employ them there. Uh, a lot of companies also don't have IT department. They have outsourced that to other organizations because these are not core. So that a company can now use its limited resources to focus on what? Its core activities as a company. So that is what the value chain basically is about. That is what the value chain basically is about. Then let's come to the second one called the SWOT analysis. Now the SWOT analysis... The SWOT analysis is a module that helps the organization to analyze its strengths. So SWOT helps the organization to identify its strengths, its weaknesses, the opportunities that is available, opportunities, and then what? The threats that the organization is exposed to. Remember that the strengths and weaknesses of the organization relates to the strategic capacity. With that, the organization has control over. So the organization can determine what its strengths can be, they can determine what its weaknesses should be. The opportunities and threats are beyond the control of the organization because they are outside. Of the organization so strength and weaknesses are inside internal opportunities and threats are outside the organization so when we say the strength of organization what do we mean by that these refers to the characteristics of the business that gives it a competitive urge or an advantage over others so when we talk about the strength of the company we are talking about the things that the company is what endowed endowed with the characteristics the nature the way the business operates that gives it that advantage or the, that competitive edge over companies strength can include issues such as the facilities the infrastructure facilities that a business is using the employees that it is using the technical know-how that they have the reputation of the company the brand of the company the processes that it is using all these are refers to as what well, the strengths of the company and these things give the company what a, 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 an edge over what other companies because it's a brand, it's a skill, it's what we are known for, it, it is what we can't be doubted about, it is our reputation, that is what people see us to be. So it gives you that competitive edge in that order. The things that gives the company a competitive edge are its strengths. Flip side is the weakness. These are characteristics that place the business at a disadvantage relative to the others. So weaknesses are the things that places the organization at a disadvantage when we compare it to others. Now weaknesses can be uh, like for instance having a poor brand is a weakness. Okay, having a poor brand as a business is a weakness. Uh, lack of technical know-how. If we don't have technical know-how in the industry that we are in or in the business that we are operating, it's a weakness. Not employing qualified staffs is a weakness. Not using state-of-the-art infrastructure facilities is a weakness. Uh, product failure. We launch new products or we launch new products or and the product fail is a weakness. Uh, Non-compliance with uh, regulatory framework or regulatory uh, standards it's a weakness. So all these can be referred to as weaknesses of organization. So these come together to give us about the strategic capacity, what the company is endowed with. Then we come to the opportunity. These are the elements that a business could exploit to its advantage. In other words, it, they, they include the markets, the sectors, the, the, the trend, the cultures, the technology that the business can what, explore in order to gain competitive advantage in all that. And then the final thing has to do with the threats. Threats include things such as now, let me, let me talk about opportunities in a moment. 
Opportunities can include issues such as policies that the government uh, put in place. There are some policies that the government can pass that provides businesses with opportunities, okay? Like policies such as the fact that there are some contracts that must be awarded to local contractors or local suppliers. So that is a policy. So it's an opportunity and businesses can take advantage of. Or the availability of a niche of a market that is on tap. So businesses can also take advantage of the that opportunity. Or the increase in trend or demand of a certain product. It's, it's, it's an opportunity businesses can take advantage of. And the last one is threats. These are elements in the environment that could cause trouble for the business. In other words, threats are the things that may prevent and limit the business not to gain competitive advantage. Some examples of threats can include measure of two major uh, competitors. So maybe there are two major competitors in the industry. They match to become a single firm. That is a threat. For instance, if you look at the telecommunication industry with a recent match of Airtel and Tigo to become Airtel Tigo or Tigo Tel, whatever it is, you will realize that in a way that has become a threat to Vodafone, in a way that has become a threat, that may become a threat to uh, MTN in the long term, even though MTN is the leading technological provider. Formerly, it was Tigo differently, it was Airtel differently, but now the two firms are I have now merged to become a single firm. So that is now a threat to the existing firms in the telecommunication industry. Another threat can be that an acquisition of a competitor by a multinational company. So if we have a competitor and a multinational company comes to acquire that competitor, that means it is a threat to us. Or government passes some uh, policies put in place some regulations that are unfavorable for our businesses like for instance the banking industry is experiencing some level of threat in relation to the new regulations that the bank of ghana is bringing in place to raise their capital requirement to 140 million ghana cities formerly 120 million ghana cities now 140 million ghana cities that sorry that has become a threat to the banking uh, firms because Many of them are complaining they don't have that money. So it's a policy that has been put in place by a regulatory authority such as the Bank of Ghana. That has now become a threat to the company. It will cause problems to the company. And many companies are going to fold up. Many companies will be forced to be merged or many companies will be forced to just uh, walk out of the banking industry in that order. So these are what we refer to as the SWOT analysis. Now, what is the objective of SWOT analysis? The objectives of SWOT analysis can be seen as one, to identify the strengths, the weakness, the opportunities, and the threats to an entity. Two, to identify the strengths to take advantage of the opportunities. Three, to modify weaknesses into strengths so that if we have any weakness, we can find out whether we can use it as a strength then to modify threats into what? Opportunities. So I have a diagram in, a, in the notes there about the strengths, about the weaknesses, about the opportunities, and about the various threats that you have to look out for in that order. So that is about SWOT analysis. One of the limitations of SWOT analysis is that it gives us a blueprint of what our weaknesses are, of what our strengths are, of what the opportunities are, and what the threats are. But the SWOT analysis by itself does not inform the organization what strategies it can implement in order to gain competitive advantage in the industry. So to be able to make the results of SWOT analysis useful, the next model we want to discuss is called the Werich Styles Matrix. So the Werich Styles Matrix is a variant of the SWOT analysis, which is another popular strategic planning method often used when devising marketing plans. Both of these techniques requires marketers or management to first identify a company or a product strength, weakness, opportunities, and what? Threats. However, this is the key aspect. While SWOT analysis aims to use strengths and weaknesses to reduce threats and maximize opportunities, the Taos metrics identify external opportunities and threats and compares them with the company's internal strengths and weaknesses. What does that mean? The Werex Styles Matrix tries to answer four questions. And by answering the, those four questions, it gives us four strategies that a business can implement in order to uh, uh, 
gain competitive advantage in the industry. The first one is what we refer to as the first one is what refers to us. So let me put that down for you. So here we call the SO, here we call the ST, here we call the WO, and we have we call the WT. Okay? SO, ST, WO, and WT. Sometimes it's drawn this way. Let me see how I put it down there. Let me see, let me see, let me see. SO, yes, I put it vertically like this. So let me go that way. Yeah, so that's how I put it. <clears throat> so what are these four questions? One, SO, strengths and opportunities. How can your current strength help you to capitalize on the opportunity? Okay, so we have a, a brand, a good brand name, we have a good reputation, we have technical know-how, we have good infrastructure facility, we have good uh, um, technology key technological advances or technological advancement or equipment that we are using as a company how do we use that in order to capitalize on the opportunity that is available in the market that is the so i'll come back to it the next one is the st how can your current strength help you to identify and avoid current and potential threats so the strength that you have how can you use it so that you can avoid any future threats that may be coming to you as a company then we have WO, that is your weaknesses and opportunities. How can you overcome your current weaknesses by using the opportunities that you have? So maybe there is a niche of the market that is on top. So even though you are a small firm, even though you don't have the technical know-how much, even though you don't have the experience, even though you don't have the money to employ the qualified staff, that niche of the market, you can still serve that niche of the market. So how do you use your... How, Weakness and how do you overcome that weakness so that you can take advantage of the opportunity and the last one is the WT that is how you can best diminish your weakness to avoid current and potential threats To be specific. I have summarized these strategies into the table that I have there so the SO strategy simply means Leverage strengths to maximize opportunities. So this is more or less like an attacking strategy Okay, it's an attacking strategy. So you leverage on your strengths so that you can maximize what the opportunities that are available. So you have a good reputation, you have a good brand, you have a good customer base, you have a large market share, you are uh, compliant, you are you are a good compliance firm. So there is an opportunity in the market. Government has said that firms can now apply for uh, certain goods so that they can be they have to supply those goods to the government it's an opportunity you can take it or there is a new market that has that is available you know people know your name already people understand the brand already so once you go there you can take advantage of that so it is an attacking strategy to take advantage of the opportunities that are available then we come to the st strategy this is leveraging on your strengths to minimize threats okay so this is what this is more or less like a defensive strategy. So yes, there may be threats available in the industry, but how do you leverage on your strengths so that you can minimize the threats? For instance, MTN. MTN will uh, be shaken a little by the measure of Airtel and Tigo. But MTN is a brand. MTN is big. MTN has the largest customer base is their strength it's a big brand so what we are saying here is that what kind of strategies can mtm put in place leveraging on their strengths so that they can minimize the threats of the measure of airtel and what tigo in that order so this is like a defensive strategy what do we use so that even though there's a threat in the environment even though there is a threat in the industry will not come closer or will not have any effect on us as a business then we come to wo these are strategies, strategy, WO strategies. These are, you counter your weakness through exploring what? Opportunities. You counter your weakness by exploring opportunities. That is, you build strength for attacking strategies. 
So yes, you know your weaknesses, but there is a strength. So what the, what the WO strategy is about is that you now build on those weaknesses. So if there's opportunity available in the market, but you have a weakness, then what do you do as a business? You employ some people. So you build on your strength so that you can now attack and take advantage of what? The industry. And then the last one is the WT strategy. That is you counter your weaknesses and your threats. That is you build strength for defensive what? strategies in that order. So these are what you have to understand in that order. These are for attacking strategies and these are for defensive strategies. But a key thing here is this. What is the objective of where it styles metrics. So let's discuss a couple of the objectives of the where it styles metrics. One, it provides a clear set of steps to move from SWOT analysis to formulate strategic options. Okay, so we know our strengths, we know our weakness, we know our threats, we know our opportunities. Now the where it styles metrics will provide us with that clear steps to follow so that we can design strategic options to undertake. Two, it makes management aware of the needs for defensive strategies in addition to strategies to grasp what opportunities. So where it starts metrics will be able to tell us or uh, will be able to help the company to be able to uh, undertake strategies that will help it to defend itself against the threats in the environment. Third, it therefore helps the organization to adopt an inherently positioned approach towards strategies so that they can now take strategy based on the knowledge they have of themselves, the knowledge they have of their industry, the knowledge they have about their operations in that order. And finally, it enables management to identify external opportunities and threats and compares them with the company's internal strengths and opportunities. So these are what you have to understand when it comes to the objectives of where it's house metrics. And that is what you must understand when we talk about environmental analysis, okay? So the key takeaways are, we've discussed about five modules. Am I right, five modules? Let's see if we can remember the five modules. The pistol framework, we've discussed about the Porter's five forces. We've spoken about the SWOT analysis. We've spoken about the value chain analysis. And we've spoken about the where it styles metrics. So five modules in that order. Please note that if these questions or these modules are asked in the case study, the examiner is not necessarily asking you to list down what you know in relation to the strengths, what amount to strength of companies, weaknesses, threats of companies. However, you're going to be answering that in relation to the case. So you read the case, then you identify things that are the strength, that, that you perceive as strength, things that looks like the opportunities, things that looks like threats, and things that looks like weaknesses of the organization. So if these questions are asked in a case study session, then you must list them out from the case study in that order. Let me also state here that Porter's Five Forces and Pistol are fundamental modules for businesses. As such, Almost every examination sitting, the examiner has been asking questions on the Porter's Five Forces and the Pistol Framework. So you must pay close attention to it. You must make sure you understand them. You must make sure you understand how these are used by businesses in order to gain competitive advantage, in order to understand their environment, and in order to become successful brands in their industry. So that is what you have to understand when it comes to the Porter's sorry, when it comes to environmental analysis in that order. And I will see you in the next module, strategy formulation.